Chapter 32 On the Wiles of the Enemy Against Those Who Have Entered the Right Path But suppose a man has overcome the first two obstacles, is filled with desire to be free of the bondage of sin, and has begun to work for it without delay. Even here the enemy does not leave him alone. He changes only his tactics, but not his evil desire and hope to make the man stumble against some stone of temptation and so ruin him. The Holy Fathers describe such a man as being under fire from all sides, from above and below, from left and right, from front and rear, from everywhere arrows speed towards him. Arrows from above are suggestions for excessive spiritual works above his powers. Arrows from below are suggestions to reduce or even completely abandon such works through self-pity, negligence, and heedlessness. Arrows from the right are when, in connection with some right undertakings and works, the enemies lead a man into temptation and the danger of downfall. Arrows from the left are when the enemies present concrete temptations and draw a man towards sin. Arrows from the front are when the enemies tempt and disturb a man by thoughts of what is to come. Arrows from the rear are when they tempt him with memories of past deeds and events. And all these tempting thoughts attack the soul, either inwardly or outwardly. Inwardly through images and pictures of fantasy, mentally imprinted in the consciousness, or through direct evil suggestions planted in the heart, accompanied by habitual impulses of passion. Outwardly, through the impressions received by the external senses in a ceaseless flow, as we have said already. Moreover, our enemies have allies in our former sinful habits and our nature corrupted by the fall of man. Having so many means to harm us, the enemy is never daunted by the first failures and constantly puts into use now one, now another means of tripping or leading astray the servant of Christ who eludes his power. After a man has decided to abandon his wrong ways and actually does abandon them, the first task of the enemy is to clear a space for an unhampered field of action against him. He succeeds in this by suggesting to a man who has entered the right path that he should act on his own and not go for advice and guidance to the teachers of righteous life who are always attached to the church. A man who follows their guidance and verifies all his actions, both inner and outer, by the good judgment of his teachers, priests in their parishes in the case of laymen, experienced startsy in monasteries, cannot be approached by the enemy. Whatever he may suggest, the experienced eye will at once see where he is driving and will warn his pupil. In this way, all his wiles are defeated. But if a man turns away from his teachers, the enemy will at once confuse him and lead him astray. There are many possibilities which do not look evil, and those he suggests. The inexperienced novice follows them and falls into an ambush where he is exposed to great dangers or is destroyed altogether. The second method of the enemy is to leave a novice not only without guidance, but also without help. A man who has decided to dispense with advice and guidance in his life, when left to himself, soon comes to the idea that extraneous help is unnecessary in the conduct of his righteous life and actions. But the enemy hastens his coming to this idea by concealing himself and refraining from attacking the novice, who, feeling thus free and unhampered, begins to imagine that this good state is the fruit of his own efforts, and so rests on them, and, while reciting his prayers about help from above, mutters them through his teeth, merely as a meaningless formula. Help is not sought and does not come, so the novice is left to his own devices and powers, and such a man is an easy prey to the enemy. The results of this self-delusion are, in some cases, that people undertake excessive tasks which are both untimely and beyond their powers. Their strong excitation of energy produced by self-reliance gives them at first the strength to sustain such works for a while. But after a time, their strength becomes exhausted and they barely find enough energy to make the most moderate efforts, 
and often abandon them altogether. Others, firing their self-willed energy more and more, reach such a degree of self-reliance that they end by imagining that everything is possible for them. In this excited state, they take to disastrous steps, throw themselves into dry wells, jump down from the high rocks where their cave is, stop taking food altogether, and so on. All this is arranged by the enemy, unperceived by the tempted. Another result of self-delusion and of ascribing one's successes to oneself is to assume the right to give oneself special dispensations and indulgences. There is a form of prelist which, when something new is introduced into life, as for instance in the case of a man who has repented, makes days seem like months and weeks like years. Thus, if a man has made a few efforts in the new order of life, the enemy easily hammers into his head the illusion, I have worked so hard, have fasted so long, spent so many nights without sleep, and so on. It is time to have a rest. Rest a while suggests the enemy. Give respite to the flesh. A little distraction is indicated. As soon as the inexperienced novice consents to this, indulgence follows indulgence, until the whole order of his righteous life is upset, and he drops back into the life he has abandoned, and begins to live again in negligence and heedlessness, and never rolls up his sleeves. These temptations to avoid the advice and guidance of others, to ascribe successes to oneself, to undertake excessive works or to give oneself dispensations, are used by the devil not only at the beginning of righteous life. He attempts to use these suggestions during its whole course. So you can see for yourself how important it is for you to do everything with advice, never to ascribe any successes, however small, to yourself, to your own powers and your own zeal, to avoid all excesses and indulgences, and to lead a life which, though even as energetic and alive, always following the order and rule once established by the example of the saints who lived before you, and by the good judgment of experienced men who are your contemporaries. <laughs>